version. Acts chapter 24, and I'll read from verses 24 to 27. This is actually the story about on Paul when he was kept, uh, was about to face trial, uh, but he was left in prison, not when he was first put in prison and then the angels brought him out, but this time he was left there for a long time, I think about two years, before he could even get a hearing. And so we'll learn a lot tonight from what Paul went through, especially when we've got delays in our lives or in our relationship uh, with God. And I'm going to be telling us why. Because I remember the last time I came here, I spoke and I gave words about how the blessings of God for some of us will be sudden. And we're going to walk into things that maybe we never planned to receive or we never even thought about. And there might be others who are wondering, the year has almost come to an end. And for you, maybe you haven't seen that happening. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But there is something that I want you to think through tonight. And that is understanding how we deal with some of the delays that happen or come across our way. So Acts chapter 24. And I'll read from verse, actually let's start from verse 22. And then we'll read it down to verse 27. He says, But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he says he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias, the commander, comes down, he says, I will make a decision on your case. So Paul was left hanging. And so he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty. And told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now, when I have a convenient time, he says, I'll call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix. And Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, what did he do? He left Paul bound. So in this case, we haven't got a miraculous deliverance, as the angel did deliver Paul from prison. But here we have a man who was kept there, not even knowing what was going to happen to him. And even when there was a change in the governor, Paul was still left bound. And Lord, I just pray tonight that you will indeed help us for the few minutes that we've got to share. To help us to understand that when things don't go according to our expectations, or maybe when we are still waiting for that to happen, what are you trying to teach us? And thank you for tonight. I didn't even know that the theme for this meeting is the 11th hour. What happened in the first hour, the second, the third, until we get to the 11th hour? And Lord, I pray that for those who are just at the crossing line of their miracle or for that which you have in store for them. Lord, I pray that you will open their eyes tonight and their hearts to receive all that you have in store for them. In Jesus' name I pray. I'm sure most of you tonight would agree with me that when we come to church or when we come to a meeting like this one, which is always set aside for us to wait upon God, get our hearts ready or prepare ourselves for what is to come. As we get ready to cross over to the new year, we do have expectations in our hearts. I don't think there's anyone sitting here tonight who would look at me and tell me that they haven't got any expectations or something that you truly want God to do for you. And it's also spiritually encouraging when we pray to God, and that's what we've been doing, I'm sure you have been doing over these past few days. When we pray to God, it's a very encouraging that when we pray to him, he answers us speedily. And you have that in scripture. There are many scriptures that tell us or that speak about God answering us speedily. 
Remember scriptures like when we call upon him, he will answer us and show us great and mighty things that we do not know. There are other scriptures that even says that before we even call upon him, that he will answer us. So we can take joy and comfort that we do serve a God whom even before we call him, he answers us and he brings the answers to us. And I do rejoice in that fact that God is ever willing to listen to me and to bring the answer. But that's not all there is to God. And I don't want us to paint this picture about God, that God is only a God who answers us speedily. Immediately we call him because we have that in scriptures. When we call upon him, he answers us. Even while we are yet speaking, God has already shown up. And for some, that's all they see about God. That God that never delays. That God, when you ask him for something, he gives it to you. That God who is like a cargo God, everything you want has already been pre-packed and waiting to be delivered. Or that God whom helps us in the times of trouble. But what about the times when you're in crisis? And I'm sure there are some of you here, you've been through crises, maybe in your life, or it could be in your families, or it could be even in your personal life. Now, what about that God when you're in crisis? And you cry out to him. You call for help. You want him to show up on your behalf. And it seems there is no answer or nothing is happening. I don't know if you've been there, but I have. The times when it looks like the heavens were sealed over my head. The times when I cried unto God. The times when I saw the contrast between the God who answered speedily when I call upon him. And the God who is trying to teach me something when the answers have not yet come to me. And there may be some of you here tonight who are going through exactly what I'm talking about. You've cried upon God. You've waited for the first hour. You've waited in the second hour. You've waited in the third hour. You've prayed. You've fasted. You've been anointed with oil. Lots of things has been done. But it seems you've come to a point you feel there are delays in your life. And maybe you can't even make sense of what God is doing or what is happening uh, to you. And for those who have been Christians for a very long time, I'm sure they can associate or identify with what I'm saying. You know, when you're a very young Christian, sometimes God does some things for you. Even before you call him, he answers. And that encourages your faith. But then as you walk with him, there will be that need for God to refine your faith. There will be that need for you to mature as you walk with him. There will be the test and the trials, those things that will happen or that will come into our lives that God will want to use to bring us to where he wants us to get to. And I'm going to show you a scripture in the book of Psalm 69 verse 3. In the book of Psalm 69, because the psalmist was a man who actually knew what it meant to go through crisis, cry upon God, and it's like the answer isn't forthcoming. Look at Psalm, 60, uh, Psalm 69, and I'll read uh, verse 3 of Psalm 69, and you, and you will get a feel of what I'm talking about tonight. In Psalm 69, verse 3, he says, I am weary with my crying. He says, my throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a curse are more than the hairs of my head. He says, they are mighty who would destroy me. Be my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing. I still must restore it. But verse 3 says, I am weary. He got to a point where he cried and cried. He says his throat was dry. His eyes fell while he waited on his God. And maybe that could describe you. You can see yourself in that scripture. Weary from crying that nobody understands or that nobody sees. Your throat is dry. You've cried and cried and cried. I remember in those days when we go for like an all-night prayer meeting and you've got some brothers or sisters who are so gifted when it comes to praying to God and, or interceding for others. They pray and cry and by the time the next morning you see them, they can't even talk because they've lost their voice from all the praying and interceding they've been going through. And maybe that describes what you are going through. You've cried, you've waited, you've looked upon God. For some others, you can actually see the blessings and the things that God is doing for them. But you know that has not yet happened to you. And you are looking up to God and you're asking what is going on. Look again in Psalm 62, another cry of the psalmist. In Psalm 62 verse 1, 
And I love in this verse how the psalmist brings it out clearly. And he says, truly, because he was a man who knew what it meant to wait upon God. He says, truly, my soul, he says, silently waits for God. But then he says, from him, that's from God, comes my salvation. His soul was waiting. He kept crying, waiting upon God. And that's what we're doing. That's what you are doing in these past few days. Crying upon God. Waiting upon God. Maybe your throat is dry. Your eyes fail while you wait upon him. But then he had that strong faith in that God. And that's why he says, in him will come his salvation. Now, if you find yourself in this situation I've just described, or maybe you haven't yet, I'm sure a day will come when you will find yourself in the picture that I've just painted that the psalmist in the cry of the psalmist. For me, when I was thinking through this message, and I said to myself, when we talk about waiting or people going through delays, I know it's not easy. It's easy for me to stand up here and tell you, well, God is going to do this for you. But for those who are really waiting and crying unto God and waiting for that next defining moment of their lives, it's not that easy for them. And that's why waiting is very, very difficult. Because when you think about it, life as we know it is very short. How many years have you got to live? And so when you compare the things you want to accomplish and the shortness of life, and you're looking up to God and wondering, when will this happen? When will my breakthrough come? When will you show up on my situation? I've cried and cried and called upon you five years, six years, four or more, depending. But when will you answer me? Remember that the story I read to you from the story of Paul. Paul, remember, wasn't even getting any younger in that, uh, by the time he was put in prison. Paul was called to go on a missionary journey. He's preached in different places. But at the time, Paul was put in prison. Some Bible commentators have it that Paul must be in his 50s. And so he still had things to accomplish. And here he was, a man who had a vision, who had places to go to, who had the gospel to preach to. He was there languishing in jail. And as long as Paul was being delayed in prison, the gospel had to wait. Nothing was ever going to happen. And that's why I said waiting is very difficult. You've got an assignment. There is something in your heart. You know things that you've got to do. But it's like it's not progressing as much as you would love it. I remember when my wife went into labor. She actually went into labor 4 a.m. in the morning. And then I drove her straight to the hospital. And then from 4 a.m. in the morning, I was waiting. It was a period. She was going through that. And the baby came 6.25 now, that wasn't easy, waiting, sitting there and doing nothing. And all I'm just doing is, when will the baby come out? When will the baby be born? And of course, friends came in, looked at her, felt sorry for her, rubbed her back and all. But the point is, for those who are waiting, it's not always easy. Now, I remember it got to a point, my wife just felt that the baby just need to come out now, that she's really had enough. And the midwife came to her and told her that, well, you're just about a few centimeters dilated. So you might have to wait a little bit more, another four hours. And she just broke down and began to weep because she couldn't bear to go through another four hours. And that's what some of you might be going through right now. Things may have become so unbearable that you can't even bear to go another day. You can't even bear to go another four hours or another four years if things continue the way they are. And that's why I'm here to you, speaking to you that there is something that God wants you to know. There is something that God wants you to see when we come to that point of waiting. And I call this the les lessons that you can learn, that I can learn when things don't happen or when we have to wait or when those delays are taking place in your life. And I'm going to take all these lessons from the story that I've just read to us from Paul's encounter now the first lesson i want you if you're taking notes to please put this down the first thing you need to learn when or what i call what god is trying to teach you or teach me when things are being delayed or when things haven't happened the way we want it to happen or when we're in that phase of waiting not knowing what will happen next the first thing that god is actually doing is god is using those times to teach us to trust him, what I call to have absolute trust in him and him alone. Absolute trust 
in that God. Now, I know this sounds very simple. When we talk about trusting God, some of you might say, well, I've got my faith in God. I trust God. If I ask you how many of you do trust God, we all raise, up our, we raise our hands. But when you begin to break it down, that what does it really mean to trust the Lord? And that's when you discover that some people do fail. What does it mean when the Bible says, trust the Lord or put your whole trust in God? What is God trying to say to me? What does it mean? How do I understand what that trust means? And this is what it means. When God says to us or when God is saying to us, trust me, when these delays or these things are happening or when we are waiting or going through the process of that waiting times, what God is saying in trusting in him is to submit all your plans and all your agenda to him. That is trusting God. It's easy to say, I trust you, Lord. But then I don't trust you enough to submit my plans and my agenda to you. I trust you, Lord, but I know what I want to do, how I'm going to do it, and how I am going to accomplish it. In fact, I'm going to show you a scripture in the book of Romans chapter 15. And you will see in Romans 15 that Paul actually had an agenda, something that he wanted to accomplish before he was sent in prison, which wasn't part of his plans. Go with me, please, to Romans chapter 15. And we'll see this together in Romans chapter 15. And I'm just going to show us the difference here between what I call a godly agenda, but which is not God's agenda. There is a great difference. In the book of Romans chapter 15, uh, let's read from 25. Look at verse 25. This was actually what his plans were, what he was going to do before Paul found himself in prison. He says, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. He said, for he pleased those from Macedonia and Achai to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. He said, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, he says, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. He says, therefore, when I have performed this, so that's what he was trying to do, take the collections and the help they sent, to another place and that's what his plans were he said when i had performed this and have sealed to them this fruit fruit he says i shall go by way of you to spain so you see what his plans were that's what he was going to do he says but i know that when i come to you i shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel so paul had his plan set out he knew exactly what he was going to accomplish and when you look at that, that was a godly plan. If you've studied Paul's missionary journey, you'll understand how it fits in in the first and the second and how this defined Paul's um, journey. So Paul was going to do this. And which was, like I said, a godly agenda. There is nothing wrong in taking the collection, going somewhere else, ministering to the other saints, and then going back in the fullness of God's blessing. That was what he wanted to do. But then, like I said, there is a difference. Something might be a godly agenda, but may not be God's agenda. And this is what so many of us need to understand. Because it's something that you think you can do. is a godly agenda. Ministering to people is my desire to win the whole Liverpool for Jesus. Now, that's a godly agenda. But it may not be God's agenda in his plan for my life in, at, this, at this time. And so if you can understand that difference, there's nothing wrong with godly agendas. You can have them, but you might find yourself in a place which may not or take you completely away from the so-called godly agenda you've got into a place where God might want to teach you something completely different from what you think that you already know. Of course, we knew that Paul eventually would get God to Rome, but it didn't happen as quick as he hoped that it will happen. And that's what happens. Yes, you know where you're going. You know what you want to accomplish. You will get there. And that's what God is saying. But it may not be the way you think is going to happen. The time you think is going to happen. And that is where the difference comes in. Paul eventually got to the place. But not at the time he thought that he was going to get there. So I don't know what your agenda is. You might say, well, it's a godly one. Yes, it may be godly. But God might be saying to you, have you submitted that plan 
to me. And I'm sure when Paul was making all these plans of where he would go to and the things that he would go to, I'm sure God must be in heaven looking at him. I said, that's your agenda. There's nothing wrong with that. But there will be other things that might happen in between from A to B before you get from one point to the other, which will still fit into the overall plan of God, but which you may not understand. And that's where you need to trust him to take you from point A to point B. And that is what God is saying. So when things are happening and God is saying, trust me, the first thing he's saying to you is trust him by submitting those plans that you have to him because he's the one that can bring it to pass remember that prayer that jesus christ prayed he says not my will but yours be done and that is the point when a man or a woman comes to that point when you can fall on your knees and look up to god and say father not my will but yours be done and the problem with many of us or many christians today is that they are so strong-willed that nothing can take them away, even from the so-called godly agendas, into God's agenda for their lives. And that's why when we find ourselves in some places or in some situations, that's when it begins to break us. That's when we can look up to him and say, well, Father, now I know what it means to really trust you. Now I know that it's not about me. Now I know that it is for your glory and nothing but for your glory. And God may be saying to you tonight, whatever you plans you've got for the new year, I'm sure some of us must have mapped them out. You've got them all written out. God may be saying to you tonight, have you laid it all before me? It's godly. There's nothing wrong with it. But he's saying, bring it before me. He's saying, lay it at my feet. That even if that does not happen the way you think is going to happen, trust me that I will still bring it to pass in your life. So trust also means submitting your plans to that God. Now the second thing which you need to take down as we uh, examine the scriptures is that trusting God also means trusting that God's power alone, mark that word, that God's power alone will accomplish his purpose for your life. That God's power alone will accomplish it. It's one thing for me to say, I do trust God. But it's another thing for me to believe that it is only God's power that can accomplish his purpose for my life. You know, sometimes we think, well, we can help the plans of God. Remember when God gave Abraham a promise and how his seed will inherit. And then he later had to move slightly away from the original plan and the picture that God gave him. And of course, took Another, another lady who we know the bond woman and that the, the gave birth to, uh, to, to the Ishmael. And we know how things unfolded. And there was so much mess in that situation. All because a man did not hold on to what God said. That it's only my power that can accomplish whatever thing that I have said. So when I say I trust God, am I saying to him, God, I trust you enough that your power alone can accomplish all that you have said to me. All the promises that you have made to me. Now, when Paul was languishing in prison, do you know, I will show you this scripture. Let's go to Acts chapter 23. And you will see what God had already said to Paul in Acts chapter 23. And this is good for us to read it. In Acts chapter um, 23, and you will see in Acts 23. This is a very crucial scripture. In Acts 23, look at verse 11. Don't forget it was in verse 24, chapter 24, that Paul was uh, that I read to us, but if you go to chapter 23, look at verse 11. And what happened? It says, But the following night, the Lord stood by him, that's by Paul, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. He says, For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, he says, So you must also bear witness at Rome. In other words, Paul received a word even before these things began. To unfold before him. The Lord stood before him. And said to him. This is what I will do to you. And so. But the interesting thing about God is. When God speaks to us. Or gives us a word. Sometimes he just shows us the bigger picture. Paul. You will testify in Rome. You must testify. But then God doesn't give us all the little details in between. The times that you will go through trouble, the times he doesn't even tell you in details some of the things that you will go through before you come to the final bit of where he's taking you to. Of course, we never saw in scripture that 
But God told him after in this scripture I just read to us that he was going to be shipwrecked and he was going to spend the night in Malta or he was even going to be held as a prisoner in Caesarea. Now God never told him all those details. But all that God said is you must testify. In other words, no matter what happens, you will get to that end and you will speak the words that I had given you. And so what this tells me is that even Felix, when he kept Paul in prison and was just moving Paul from place to place, and these plans could not destroy the purpose of God over the life of Paul. And that is what you need to understand. That no man, no one can destroy God's plan for your life. If God had given you a word and had given a promise over your life, no matter what happens in between A and B, or A to Z as we might want to call it Z, the reality is that God has said it, that you must testify at the end. And that is all that matters. So what have God spoken into your life? What have God said that will happen to you in the coming year? What are the promises that you have held on to daily in your heart that this is what God has spoken? I know the promises that God has given me. I know the things that God has said concerning me. And so when I pray to God, I say to him, no matter what happens, I might be held in prison. I might be kept. I might be held bound now. And I'm not experiencing the fullness of what you want me to experience. But the reality is that no matter what happens in between, I will testify at the end of it. And that gives you, that's what trusting God is all about. Trusting him that his power that started it from the beginning, that same power will finish it right at the end. And I'm sure that this is where most people fail. Because when things are not going the way you expected, the blessings seem to be delayed. You're waiting and crying and your throat is dry. You're looking up to God and wondering, God, are you the same God that said it? This is the 11th hour. This is the fourth hour. This is the first hour. What exactly is going on? And there may be people who are asking that question right now. And God is saying, if you claim that you trust me, you will trust my power to accomplish everything that I have spoken to you about. Felix was not strong enough to destroy God's plan for Paul. Remember, he was waiting for a bribe to be given him, and so he sent him back in prison. And everything that was going on around Paul was never enough to stop Paul from testifying of what God had spoken. And so you need to take courage in that. That no power of hell. That's why I love that song in Christ alone. No power of hell. No skin of man can ever pluck me from his hands. If you sing that song over and over to yourself. Then you know that those words are real. And they are true. No power of hell. No skin of man can ever destroy the plans and the purpose of God for your life. Number three, what we need to know about trusting God again, and this one is quite exciting in this verse of scripture I read to us, is that we must also trust in, not just in God, trusting in God, but not in our changing circumstances. And I will explain that to you. Trust in God alone and not in the changing circumstances of our lives. And I will explain this to you how it works. You see, what happens is that when we go through trials or troubles, we may say, well, I've put my trust in God. But then, let me give you a good example. You're looking for a job and you've been jobless for so long, maybe three, four, five years. And then something changes about that situation. Maybe, for instance, you get a letter for an interview. Your, your hope rises. You are excited. Oh, something is going to happen. Or maybe you made an application and you're just called. And what most people do is that they gradually move their soul trust from God and they begin to put it in the situation, in the changing circumstances of their life, which means that something positive is happening. And so their faith now shifts from God and then rests on that soul light that they are beginning to see at the end of the tunnel. And what happens? When that doesn't happen, they are shattered. Their whole hope is dashed. They are taken back to where they, used, they started out from and they are wondering, but what exactly happened? I thought this could be the breakthrough that I had, I had hoped for. No matter what is happening to you, and that's what I've learned even as a pastor. In a church, people come and go. And that is part of the changes in circumstances that we are called. And so if as a pastor, I'm trusting that because maybe I've got this group of people whom God has brought, and that will be all that I need to hold on to. Then what if they leave? 
or they find themselves somewhere or God moves them somewhere else, what happens? Because things have changed, it affects my, not just my focus, but it affects my trust in that God who has called me to put my soul trust in him. And I'll show you from the scripture we read in Acts 24, that never happened to Paul. Because if you look at Paul, this is what happened in verse 26. Let's look at Acts chapter 24 and see verse 26. Because verse 26 said that meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him from prison. He says, therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. Now, put yourself in Paul's shoes for a minute. This man calls you out and then talks with you. Now, it gives you a little bit of hope that something is going to happen. He might give his life to Christ and maybe he might bring me out of prison. And then he, not knowing that he had something else in mind, then he throws him back into prison. And how do you think that Paul would have felt? Or maybe you, if you were in Paul's shoes, how you'd have felt. But Paul was a man who knew that the changing situations that we go through, I can always change. That things today can get better and things the next week might completely change. In fact, it was when Paul was in this prison that he wrote the letter that he wrote to the Philippian Christians. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and you can understand Paul's mindset. In the book of Philippians chapter 3 and you see what Paul said in that scripture and I love that scripture now this doesn't sound like a man who is in prison but Paul knew never to trust in the things that change around him look at book of Philippians chapter 3 and I'll, I'll read verse 1 he says finally my brethren he says rejoice in who in the Lord, not in the things that change around you or the little flicker that gives you hope that this is, oh, something is looking bright and positive. It says, for me to write to you is, is the same thing to you. He says, it's not tedious, but for you, it is safe. And then look at uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 4 again. In chapter 4 of the same book of Philippians, chapter 4, look at verse 4. He then says, rejoice in who? In the Lord always. He says, again, I will say rejoice this we are prison letters that's what i'm reading out to us this we are prison rejoice in the lord not in whether felix calls you out and sends you back in not in whether things around you have changed or haven't changed not in whether you've gotten the letter of interview or maybe whether the young man or the young or has proposed and said he was really going to get married to you if you're a lady that's not what he's saying because that's what people do Imagine if, let me, put, let me bring it home now, you're a lady and you've been waiting on God, hoping that Mr. Wright will show up. And then you're waiting for one day he will speak and propose to you. And then when he comes to your house and he gets friendly and all of that, somehow your hope rises and you think, oh, he's getting a lot friendly. It looks like he's going to speak one day. And then after that, he stamps up, dusts his trousers, and then he walks back home. And you're wondering, what is going on? I've just fed him. He's just eating all my rice. <laughs> He's just been occupying space all this while. And, and your hope rises. And then the next minute is dashed again. But your hope should be in God and God alone. Because he's the one who brings the right person into your life. He's the one who knows what you need. He's the one who can make it happen in his own time. When this man called Paul out and took him in. That's why Paul in this letter, he was writing, he said, Rejoice always in the Lord. It has to be in the Lord and nothing else. Look again in Psalm 118. I love this one in Psalm 118. In Psalm 118. And um, if you look at verse 8 of Psalm 118, and this might be a warning for some, it says, it is better. Look at someone and tell him, it is better. He said, to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now, I don't need an extended commentary on this one. It is better to trust in the Lord. No matter how faithful people are around me, I don't put my trust in them. We all are human. People will be, they will always at one point fail you. No matter how much they say they love you, they care about you, we will stand by you. Remember Peter? If everyone denies you, I will not deny you. I will stand by you. I will even to death. And Jesus Christ looked at him and said, really? He said, it's not going to be long before the cock crows twice. You will deny me 
this and, and it happened exactly as jesus remember the scripture that says that jesus did not commit himself to man because he knew what was in man and that's how we are and that's why no matter what you do in your dealings with people love them but let your trust your complete and utter trust and this is what god is saying to you be only in god because things will change around you i remember years when my father died i trusted him so much that we had a future together and that things was going to he was in fact without him i w i was no nobody and that was so much the kind of trust i had in him and i remember the day that he died and i went to see him just lying there and i could see him just like a piece of wood with no life in him and for me it was like all my hopes and dreams had all disappeared and that dawned on me woe is he who puts his trust in man but blessed is that man whose god is the god of israel the man who puts his whole hope and trust in his god things will come things will go things will change on around us but the word of the lord the bible says it abides forever so trust him to bring it all to pass no wonder why the prophet Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5. I don't know how many of you have seen that scripture in the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to read it to you. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5. And look at what he says in Jeremiah 17 verse 5. He says, thus says the Lord. This is God speaking now. He says, cursed is the man who does what? Who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. He says, whose heart departs from the Lord. And then he says, this is what he's going to be like. He shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not be seen when good comes, but shall inhabit the patched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. And that's when we and this is the wisdom of God. When God says it, God means it. And that's why we have to trust in God. That's what it means. Trusting in God alone and not in the changing situations or circumstances of your life. Number four, what trusting God means. And I'm sure this one will hit right home to some of us. When we talk about trusting God, trust God by doing what you know in your heart to be right, even if that does not meet your goals or the goals that you've set out for yourself. That's what trusting God means. Trusting him by doing what you know to be right in your heart and through the scriptures, even, if though, even though it has not met the goals or the things that you've set out before you. And I'll tell you why, why this is so. Because when we go through trials and troubles and the times of waiting, when we don't really know what is happening with our lives and whether the plans of God over us will unfold or not, that's the time of compromise for some. And that's the time many of us feel like cutting corners. This scripture, are you sure that it works? Pastor Fala has called us for prayer and fasting, and we fasted and prayed, and nothing seems to be. And then some people stop doing the things they know in their hearts to be right, but which God demands of them to do. Now, you might ask me, but how, how does that relate to Paul's story? I'll tell you how. Remember that Paul, if Paul had given Felix a bribe, Paul would not have stayed in prison for another two years. Remember that he called him out of prison. And the Bible said he was hoping in the verse 26 that we read that some bribe or money would be given to him so that he can release him. But Paul was a man of integrity. He knew that he'd rather stay in prison than bribe his way out of prison. And that's why I always say this to people. Anything that you do today that will haunt you tomorrow, I think it's better not to do it. You can imagine if Paul had paid his way out of prison. He had given that bribe. And then a few months later, Paul stands before the Areopagus, preaching the gospel. How would people describe him? They would have said, is that not the man that bribed his way out of prison? How would that have affected the testimony of the gospel? And that's why Paul can stand and say, be you imitators of me as I am of Christ. If you're a man given to bribery, you can't say that be an imitator what are we going to imitate you see so paul was a man full of he knew and this is where people fail they say well i trust god but then when there are times of delay waiting 
That's when compromise creeps in. That's when they begin to listen to advice. Why not cut corners? This might get you a better result. Why not do it this way so that you can accomplish your aims? But as the scripture says in the book of Proverbs 22 verse 1, I don't know how many of you have read it. Let's read this scripture together in Proverbs 22 uh, verse 1. In Proverbs 22 verse 1, it says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. It says, loving favor rather than silver and gold. A good name, what does that mean to you? You are called as a child of God. You're called one who bears the light. You're called a Christian. Does that name mean anything to you? For some, it doesn't. For some, when they go through times and things haven't worked, that's the time they mix in with the crowd. But that's not what God is calling us to do. He says, if you trust me, if you really, really trust me, you, maybe for some of you, you can't even see how the result is going to unfold. And you're sitting right here, another year is coming, and you're under this intense pressure to compromise or to do the things you know in your conscience. Your conscience is telling you, do not do it or don't go down that lane. The question is, will you give in? But we have an example here. Paul stayed back in prison. We always talk about the God who brings out of prison. But we never talk enough about the people who can accept a God that can keep them in prison. Even if that enhances the course of the gospel. And that is what we've not talked so much about. It's all about maybe deliverance. But if the deliverance can be gotten through a, a wrong means, Paul is saying, I'd rather stay back here. And wait until God brings me out. Or until his, until his will unfolds in my life. And this may be a lesson for some of you tonight. Do what you know to be right. That's trusting God. God, I'm, I'm doing this. Though it might cost me to suffer. I don't know why I'm doing it. But at the end of it all, you will see why you're doing what you are doing so trusting god as god is calling us we've seen what that means and i'm going to begin to round up now by giving us the second reason of what we the second lesson what we learn when when we go through this delays this is not going to be long and uh, i should be rounding it up quick as quickly as i can so that we can go into just a short prayer and then a little bit of ministration here The second thing we need to know when we go through some of these waiting times and it seems the things that we hope for or praying for or have planned for have not happened. Apart from trust, the next thing that God is teaching us is the concept of submission, the lesson of submission. Those are two different things. Trust and submission. When we talk about submission, we are talking about submitting to his lordship. Although you can't have one without the other. If I truly trust God, that's when I submit to him. So you cannot say you trust and you're not submitted. You cannot say, well, I believe that I can do what is right and the results will come. And yet not submit yourself and say, God, whatever it is, I am willing. So when God is saying, yes, I know you're going through trials. I know things haven't happened. I know you've gone through it. You've cried and you've waited. Yes, the lesson is trust me. But then he's saying again, the lesson there for you is submit. Submit to him. Submit to him. And what does submission mean to you? If I ask you tonight, what do you understand by submission? For some, maybe for some husband or wives, they see submission as a man ruling over his wife. And not letting her speak. And that's the picture of submission some have. But when you come to your relationship with God, that's not what it's all about. Because submission, as we relate to God, plays out in different ways. And when you look at Paul, you see that Paul was a man who was truly submitted to the will of God. And you might ask me, how do I know that? Because in Paul's letters, if you read most of Paul's letters, you'll agree with me that Paul got to a point that he actually did acknowledge that God is the one who is God and that he is not. Read letters of Paul. Listen to the way Paul spoke. And that's what submission is all about. Because sometimes you think that you can control your life. I've had people say this, oh man is the prime mover of his destiny. And we think that we have the power to do things and change whatever. And there is so much book written about self-help and how you can transform and change your life. Now for the Christian, we have to read, you might read them. But you have to come to a point where you understand that God alone is God. We are talking about divine God's sovereignty here. 
We are talking about his lordship here. We are talking about he is the lord of all creation. And all he's called me to do is to submit. Look at Psalm 127. And you can understand clearly what I'm saying here. In Psalm 127, if you read verse 1 of Psalm 127, and you see, I love the way the psalmist uh, puts it there in Psalm 127. Uh, look at, look at the verse, from verse 1. He says, unless the Lord builds the house. And what does he say? He says, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord. You see that? Unless. And that is what we are talking about. By acknowledging, and this is what it means. Unless God, you do it. It's not about me. It's not about me doing it. Unless you bring this to pass. And I've been in situations like that when I knew. I said, unless God does it, I know this can be done. If you haven't come to this point, then you haven't come to that total point of submission. When you know God, even the doctors can help me. God, even my family can help me. At the moment, my back is against the wall and no one can help me. But all you're saying is, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, he says the watchman stays awake in vain. And that's what we need to understand, that there is a builder. Remember in, in the Bible, where the Bible says that we are looking for that heavenly city, whose maker and builder is God. When you understand there is a maker and a builder, you submit to him. Imagine a builder on the site looking at the architect and telling him, well, I don't care about what you've designed. I can see the plan. I've got it before me, but it means nothing. Well, I'll go ahead and build what I want irrespective of what your design says. And that's what some people are doing with their lives. And then they look at God and say, well, I'm submitted to you. No, you're not. Submission acknowledges that God is the maker and the builder. He's the one who has the blueprint and wants us to walk and follow him. Again, when we talk about submission, and I love this. This is so simple. Now, I got this even, is you find this in Paul's letters. When you go to the book of Philippians uh, chapter 2, and I'm going to show you in Philippians chapter 2. Because when people go through the times of waiting, that's when they begin to grumble against God, complaining. But you show to God that you are fully submitted when you, as a Christian, don't grumble. Look at the book of uh, Philippians chapter 2. And I'll just read this quickly uh, to you. The book of Philippians chapter 2, and I think from verse, let's read verse 14. And verse 15, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 14, he says, do all things without what? Now, like I said, this doesn't sound like a letter written from prison, but actually it is. How can a man in prison saying, do things without complaining? Felix has brought him out, put him back in. That's an opportunity for him to complain. But because he was so submitted to that God and to the will of the heavenly father, He's now writing to them and says, do all things without complaining. And he says, and disputing. In verse 15, he says that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. He says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, isn't that wonderful? Because all Paul is saying is simple that this is how you prove that you are a child of light. By not, not just saying that you're a Christian, but when you're submitted to God, you put away grumbling. Think about the children of Israel. What destroyed most of them from entering into the promise? Grumbling and murmuring. When things got tough, they began to complain. When there were delays, food wasn't coming, they complained. Every single day, they complained. Oh, this is the food we've been eating. We've had it so many times over and over. And God said, the Bible says that God was angry with those people and swore in his wrath said they will not enter into my rest and god's intention is to bring you into his rest but so many people cut themselves short by complaining by murmuring and by saying to god you are not god so when you see blessings or things happening for some others and it hasn't happened to you that's not a time to make comparisons that's not a time to get jealous and angry and look up to god and saying i really can't figure out what you're what you're about is a time to submit to him and say, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't know what it's all about. Blessings all around me. But I submit and I trust you to fulfill your purposes in my life. And that's why that song that we sang, Speak, O Lord, 
Speak, O oh Lord. Speak into my heart and bring peace. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church is built. Speak, O oh Lord, and fulfill your purposes in me. That's how we do it. Submission means that you, as a Christian, put away grumbling and complaining. And then the last one under this, and I love this. And this is very applicable. I would say this is by way of practical application. Because when we talk about submitting to God, some people say to me, well, I, I'm submitting or I'm submitted to God. And I know things haven't happened to me. Uh, the, the blessings haven't come yet. Uh, what I'm looking for have not happened. And so what they do is they actually do nothing as they are waiting or as those delays are taking place in their lives. But when you are submitted to God and you're waiting or those delays are going through, uh, happening, what you should actually be doing, what submission means for me and for you, is that we ought to be taking advantage of every opportunity that God presents or brings our way while we are still waiting or while we are going through those times that delays are taking place in our lives. And I will tell us how Paul, how this played out in Paul's life. If you go to the book of 2 Timothy, because while Paul was in prison, things weren't happening the way he expected it to happen. You will see what was going on in Paul's life. In the book of 2 uh, uh, Timothy, look at chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and let's read verse 13. Also, this was a letter he was writing to Timothy. And don't forget that most of Paul's letters, actually close to them, were written while he was in prison. And you, you see this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And you see what he said in verse 13. As he says, bring the cloak that I left with Kapos at Troas. He says, when you come, he says, and the books, especially the parchments. And so this was, Paul was a man who was taking advantage of every opportunity. Although he was not where he wanted to be, but he was still studying and he was reading. Bring the books. I can't keep complaining. I can't keep murmuring against God, but do something while you're waiting for that to unfold. And because for me, I found this very remarkable. Because like I said, most of the letters or what we have in this book, as we have it, these are letters. We call them letters written by Paul. And that's what we have today as scripture. So imagine if Paul sat and did nothing while he was in prison. Do you think that the Pauline epistles and the letters that we have to him, which we have in the scriptures today, we would have had it. For every opportunity, the good and the bad in Paul's life, Paul took advantage of it. He was reading, he was studying, and that might be a word for someone here tonight. Yes, the thing you're waiting for has not happened, but God is saying to you, do something while you wait. Yes, you haven't gotten your dream job or the things that you were hoped for have not happened. Do something while you wait. And that's where some people fail. They look at the goal or the overall picture of what they want to accomplish. And because that doesn't, hasn't happened, they fold their hands and do nothing. They fold their hands and complain. They fold their hands and murmur against God. They fold their hands asking themselves questions. But God may be saying to you, do something while you, while you wait. Upgrade yourself, your knowledge. Repackage yourself. That may even be a word for someone. As you're going over to a new year, see yourself as a whole new person. Add a little bit more value to yourself. And that's what Paul was doing. He wasn't just a man who sat and did nothing. But Paul took advantage. And if you read that scripture that I read to us in Acts chapter 24, even when Felix calls him out, he took advantage of it and preached to him. And he sent him back. And that was it. He brought him back again. And he was relating, taking advantage of those opportunities. I remember one message I preached here, uh, taking advantage of opportunities. Maybe some of you might have to listen to that again. But this is what it's all about. Take advantage of every opportunity that God brings to you. You don't have to wait until your defining moment for you to step into it. But the little here, a little there, line upon line, precept upon precept, and that's what brings you to the bigger picture of what God intends for you. So tonight, like I said, many of you might be in this situation. You've cried unto God, you've waited, you've looked up to him, and you're asking that question, why? God is not just a God who answers speedily and suddenly. He's also a God who can allow you to go through, through these things. He can allow delays in your life. He can allow you 
to wait and cry upon him, even get to the last hour. But when you go through it, God is saying, there is a lesson in there for me. Trust me to accomplish it. Submit to my perfect will, and you will see my purposes unfold in your life. Look at someone beside you and tell him, trust God to accomplish what he started. Look at someone else and tell them, submit to the will of the Almighty. And you will see next year unfold before you. Shall we rise up to our feet tonight and just give God all the praise and all the glory. Give him all the praise tonight. Give him all the praise tonight from your heart. Give him all the praise tonight from your heart. Give him all the praise. He is a comforter. He hasn't forgotten. He hasn't forsaken. He knows the promises that he's made. But the problem is some say I trust. But then when the test comes they fail. They don't trust God enough. That his power can accomplish it. They don't trust him enough to submit their plans to him. They don't trust him enough to continue doing what they know to be right. Even if their objectives are not being met. They don't trust him enough. And that's what God is calling you to tonight. Trust me. Trust me. Submit to my perfect will for your life. It's all about a relationship. He wants to draw you into a deeper relationship. He wants to draw you in. He wants to draw you in. Tonight, God is strengthening your faith. Tonight, God is doing a work in your life. He's saying to you, I started it and I will finish it. And all he wants from you is faithfulness. He is a faithful God. He's a faithful God. And we're going to sing that song, Faithful One, So Unchanging. And you will express that love, that trust, that confidence that you have in God tonight. Faithful One, So Unchanging.